In organometallics part one, we talked about all the different organometallic reagents we could have. Remember, we can have acetylides, which are the triple bonds with the negative charge at the end, the terminal alkyne. We can have Grignard reagents, which are our alkyl magnesium halides. We can have organolithium reagents, and there's also Gilman reagents, which are a little more complicated. They're lithium dialkyl cuprates, but even though it's dialkyl, we can only use one of them. So those are our options, and they can actually be used in a lot of synthesis stuff to make carbon-carbon bonds. Because often when we have a nucleophile, a nucleophile is, I don't know, like ammonia or bromine minus or OH minus, etc., etc., right? And those aren't going to help us make carbon-carbon bonds. So in that case, these organometallic reagents are really useful. And one place that we learn about these organometallic reagents is when we talk about alcohols, and in conjunction with that, when we talk about carbonyl groups. So a carbonyl group looks like this. That's a carbonyl. And it can be kind of one of two things. We can have an aldehyde. And we can have a ketone. So an aldehyde, I recently learned that that comes from alcohol and dehydrogenation, which is exactly what it is. If you take an alcohol and you take hydrogens away, you get an aldehyde. And ketone comes from, actually, acetone is this little guy. Remember this from our aprotic solvents. So acetone. I learned recently that once upon a time in Old German, it was called acetone. And this acetone, somebody took this and just broke it apart and made ketone. So that's where the names come from. So we've got an aldehyde and a ketone. And I lied, that's not all we can do with our carbonyl. We also have something called a carboxylic acid. I've also heard it just called a carboxyl or carboxy group, but I call it a carboxylic acid. And the reason why is because this little proton can come off and we can make a nice resonance stabilized conjugate base. There's also something called an acid chloride and that's literally you take that acid and you replace the acid part, which is the OH with the chloride. So that's an acid chloride. And last but not least, we also have something called an ester. where we just add like another carbon group on the end. So a lot of these can react with nucleophiles and it doesn't have to be an organometallic reagent, but a lot of the times it is an organometallic reagent because we're trying to string carbons together to make whatever alcohol or whatever um, carbonyl thing that we wanna make. And so for the purposes of this video and for the purposes of only doing each reaction once, I'm gonna be using a Grignard reagent, but we can do this with the acetylides, we can do this with organolithiums, we can do this with Gilman reagents. So we're going to start simple and we're going to start with an aldehyde. And what happens when I react this aldehyde with methyl magnesium bromide? And I hope that because I'm using a methyl, this will be simple and I won't have to do a lot of drawing. So this guy has got a minus and this guy's got a plus. Remember, the whole point of the magnesium is to give the carbon a minus charge. And this carbon is going to attack. And I think I said this in the other video that all these organometallic guys, they are strong nucleophiles. So they're always going to do second order like reactions, SN2 like reactions. So in SN2, that kind of means everything's happening all at once. So this nucleophile wants to attack something. What do you think it might attack? Well, this oxygen pulls electrons, it's partial negative, and this carbon is partial positive because of that. So this nucleophile, this strong nucleophile is going to come in here to this carbon and we need a leaving group, right? Oxygen by itself is a terrible leaving group. We do not want to cut this off right here and just have oxygen leave by itself. Have you ever seen one oxygen by itself? I have not. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to make the pi electrons a leaving group. And when I say pi electrons, remember that in a double bond, we have two bonds. We've got a sigma bond and the sigma bond is kind of like the foundation and the pi bond is like the decoration, right? So we're going to take whatever electrons are in the second bond, the pi bond, and we're going to give them back to the oxygen. So from that, we're going to get something that looks like this. We have an R, which is like whatever alkyl group. We're going to have this middle carbon. We're going to have our Grignard. So this was that. And we're going to have an O minus because here 
The oxygen has two lone pairs. Here it's got three lone pairs because we gave it an extra. And if you do the math for the formal charge, you'll see that it has a minus. And then here we have our hydrogen because it's an aldehyde or it used to be an aldehyde. And then our magnesium bromide is like hanging out somewhere else and we don't care about it. So what happens now? Well, most of the time when we get to this point, when we use a carbonyl and we get an O minus, what we're gonna do is we're gonna protonate it. So we've got an H plus. Maybe it comes from H3O plus, maybe it comes from another acid, but we're gonna protonate it and we're gonna get this product. And this is called a secondary alcohol. So aldehydes can make secondary alcohols because this carbon that has the OH is bonded to two other carbons. Now I just recently, these past few months, worked with a batch of students who had a professor who he would not put in the protonation step. He would leave you with, okay, we're going to react this Grignard with this carbonyl, and he would not give you the second step of the proton. So the point of that is that sometimes this protonation, because it's so common, it gets assumed. So please, if you end up with an O-, minus, you're probably going to end up protonating it. So that's what's going to happen. So you know how I just said that um, in aldehydes you get a secondary alcohol? Well, there's kind of a special case. It's called formaldehyde. And formaldehyde is the simplest aldehyde there is. It's like a double aldehyde. And if we react it again with our same Grignard reagent, it's going to pop itself in there as a nucleophile because that's a partial positive carbon it's going toward. Our pi electrons are going to leave. We had two lone pairs on here, so we're going to get three on here. I'm just going to combine the H's to be H2. And we're going to get our Grignard reagent came in over there. And then in the end, we're going to protonate it. To get a primary alcohol. So formaldehyde makes primary alcohols out of Grignard reagents and aldehydes with another like carbon group on them that are not formaldehyde make secondary alcohols. So what happens if we have a ketone? So I'm going to use acetone. I'm going to stop using R because I don't like using R groups. I'm going to use acetone as our ketone. It's the simplest ketone and we're going to have our Grignard reagent again. What happens when I pop this in here? Where is it going to attack? It's going to attack that carbonyl carbon, and we're going to pop out some electrons, and we're going to get this, and if we protonate it, then we're going to get and I'm just drawing our methyl as a stick instead of a methyl, like a CH3. It's the same thing. So this is that. And we're going to get what's called a tertiary alcohol, right? Because this carbon in the middle here is bonded to three other carbons. So that's how we react with aldehydes and ketones. Now we're going to try something a little different. We're going to react with an ester. So here's our ester and we're gonna react it with our Grignard. This is plus, this is minus. I'm gonna stop drawing the lone pairs on the oxygen, but we know that they're still there. We're gonna get an O minus. And our Grignard, which is here. And I'm going to start drawing our Grignard like a stick but it's our Grignard, so this is our Grignard, our methyl, and that's a methyl. So what happens next with our ester is a little bit different because in this ester, we have this kind of thing that looks like a leaving group. And I know it's not ideal because alkoxides are not that great of leaving groups, but let's say we're in a basic environment, which means that we often have negative charge. So we might be able to do this leaving group thing. So one of the lone pairs on this oxygen is gonna pop back in and we are going to reform our double bond. And when we do this, carbon in the middle says, I have too many bonds. I'm going to have five bonds. What do I do? What do I do? Where is the best leaving group? The best leaving group is going to be this alkoxide group at the end of the ester. And what we're going to get is this ketone looking thing. So again, if we're tracking our Grignard, our Grignard is here. And somewhere else, 
our alcohol side is going to be hanging out. And maybe it, like, finds a proton or something. But that's what we're going to get in the end for an ester. A similar mechanism happens with acid chlorides. So I'm going to switch it up here. I'm going to do this. Acid chloride. And again, we have our Grignard reagent. We've got a negative and a positive. So our carbon is negative. It's going to attack this partial positive carbon. And our pi bond electrons are going to leave. We're going to get this product here with an O minus and a chlorine. And here's our Grignard. Our Grignard is that little methyl group hanging off. So now the same thing happens. We're going to actually reform a double bond. And so basically my rule for this is like, this is the central carbon here, right? If I've got to this point and I just attacked a carbonyl and I have an O minus, I go, is there a good leaving group on here? If not, like if there's only carbons, like let's say my thing looked like this, right? There's no good leaving group on that. I'm not going to reform the double bond. I'm going to protonate it. But say it's this acid chloride thing. Chloride can leave. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop this double bond back in here and I'm going to make a ketone. So these things, as I've mentioned, can be useful in synthesis, which is basically in organic chemistry, when they give you a problem and they say, start with this and end with that, and what the heck goes on in the middle. And usually it's going to be multiple steps, but when we start, we're going to start with maybe one or two steps. So say I told you that you have um, formaldehyde. You start with formaldehyde. And I want to find a way to make it into hexanol. If we look at formaldehyde and we look at hexanol, hexanol in this carbon actually has two hydrogens, but we don't draw them, right? So these things look kind of similar. So that could be our formaldehyde, right? And we know just from all the stuff we just did that we can start with a carbonyl group and make an alcohol. So now I say, okay, we have this piece. It's a five carbon chain. And where might I get it from in such a way that it's going to attack the carbonyl carbon in formaldehyde? Well, let's switch things up a little bit. I'm tired of Grignard's. Let's use pentyl lithium. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, I have the right number of carbons. And it's going to attack formaldehyde. So lithium is plus, this carbon has a lone pair and is minus, it's going to attack. Electrons come out, we get this. And so all I did here was that I took this formaldehyde and I made it kind of like a skeletal structure and it became minus. Then all I have to do is protonate it and we're going to get that. So that's kind of an intro to synthesis and how you'll be doing syntheses in the future. Now there's one more group, and I totally forgot to mention it, that can react with these organometallics, or really with any nucleophile, and it's kind of a cousin of all these carbonyl groups, but it's not a carbonyl. And it's super weird and kind of scary, but it's not as bad as it seems. It's called an epoxide, and it's an ether, but it's a little tiny cyclic ether, and maybe it looks like this and has some like extra stuff hanging off of it. It can really be anything. We can have an epoxide that looks like this. We can have an epoxide that looks like that. I don't know, basically anything. But the point is that these epoxides are these little triangle oxygens and they're kind of uncomfortable. If you've learned about ring strain, you know that the best cycles in organic chemistry are cyclopentyls and cyclohexyls, that is to say like five-membered or six-membered rings, right? So if we have a three-membered ring, this is super, super uncomfortable. And so we oftentimes, when we have this epoxide, what we want to do is open it up. We want to open it up. So I'm actually going to go back to our same old Grignard reagent, methylmagnesium bromide, right? And so this is positive and this is negative. And because it's negative, it's going to act like a nucleophile. And this time it's kind of different because we have two partial positive carbons, right? We have a partial negative here, partial positive here, partial positive here. Now, remember how I told you that these are strong nucleophiles, these Grignard regions are strong. So 
Is this going to act like an SN1 or SN2? That's right, it's an SN2-like reaction, and in SN2-like reactions, what we're worried about is steric hindrance. And what I mean to say when I say that is that we do not want steric hindrance. We want there to be freedom, we want there to be space to get in there physically, right? So which one of these carbons is better? That's right, the primary carbon. So we're going to go for the primary carbon, and this carbon, it's bonded to two hydrogens that are not shown. So it goes, I have five bonds now, what do I do? It's going to make this oxygen leave, it's going to open up the epoxide ring, and at this point, I want to start numbering the carbons. We're going to go one, two, three, four, and five. So when we make our product, we are going to have, here is four, three, two, one. And we had our nucleophile attack. So we have an extra methyl here, and that is going to be five, right? Now, where is our oxygen still bonded to? Well, we made it leave off of carbon 4. It's still on carbon 3, so it's going to be here, and it's going to be an O-. And again, what we can do is protonate it, and we're going to get this alcohol-looking thing. So that's epoxides. I hope they might be a little bit less scary now. Literally, all you have to do is pick the carbon that's less sterically hindered, unless you're doing an SN1-like reaction, which, I mean, they ca that can happen. All you have to do is protonate the epoxide first. So let's say that my reaction with this epoxide was instead something like, I'm gonna use the same epoxide like that, but we're gonna have H3O plus. So what's gonna happen instead is that the first step is that we're gonna have this here and it's going to attack. And we're going to get this and actually, I want to I want to change this epoxide because it's an SN1. I'm going to make that tertiary. It's going to be like nice and stable now. So what's going to happen is now this is protonated. And when oxygen's got three bonds, it's positive. And so now we want to make a carbocation because this is an SN1-like reaction now. And so this is going to leave. Electrons are going to be given to that OH. And what we're going to get is something that looks like this. So this carbon is this carbon, and then this is going to be our cation here, and it's got that and that, right? Not too happy because we have this oxygen pulling away electron density, but we do have a tertiary carbon, so it's going to be fine. And then I made it water, so this is going to be like we're going to add another hydroxyl group because we used up... The H, like the proton on H3O+, plus, so now it's just plain H2O, it's going to pop itself in there. I know, I made it kind of cramped, but now this is plus, and now all we have to do is, like, grab a proton and give it back its electrons, and we're going to get something that looks like this. Yeah, I know, super weird looking, but that's the point, is that epoxides can technically do both. You just have to see which reaction am I doing, and it really just works like any old SN1 or SN2. It just looks intimidating. So, I hope this helps. Now you know what to do with various carbonyl and epoxide compounds.